this isn't the way I wanted to start my channel. I'm more of a storyteller, and I wanted to experiment with telling stories using different media, but I can't let what has happened recently go by without saying my piece. I hope you don't mind the picture of the sunset. In this case, I think a simple image is best. The reds of the sunset reflect my anger, while at the same time, sunsets are rather calming. I also can't help but think, as I look at the picture, that maybe the next elven ship that leaves to sail into the west might have room for me on board. The Susan J. Komen Foundation has decided to stop funding Planned Parenthood. The ostensible reason for this is that Planned Parenthood is under investigation and that the Susan J. Komen Foundation will no longer be giving money to any organization that is under investigation. This is a specious argument. The investigation in question is nothing but a witch hunt directed at Planned Parenthood by Christian fundamentalists who are against abortion because it conflicts with their own personal religious convictions. Never mind anyone else's beliefs, apparently theirs are the only ones that count, and that their interpretation of one holy book, the Bible, King James no doubt, should triumph over all. This argument is also disingenuous since the Komen Foundation's new senior vice president holds similar anti-abortion positions. The Komen Foundation says that this is not political. It clearly is. They say that it has nothing to do with their new senior vice president and her views, but the timing of this decision is indicative that that is not so. This is an attack on women's health care, and the real excuse is that Planned Parenthood does ex abortions, even though they ignore that only a small percentage of Planned Parenthood does is abortions. Now, I don't like abortion, but it needs to be safe and legal. I remember when abortion was not. I had friends nearly die because they had illegal abortions. I also remember that when abortion was illegal, there was a sort of underground railroad which helped women find safe abortions, even going so far as to drive women to a state where abortion was legal. I can assure you that abortion comes illegal, or this will occur again. What will also occur are women's deaths from illegal abortions. We must not let that happen again. As I said, I don't like abortion, but I'm not going to tell someone else what to do. I've never been raped, but I came close once. One summer when I was 22 or so, around 1972, I had finished working in the yard and walked in my front door to go to the kitchen to get a beer and relax. Unbeknownst to me, my neighbor from across the street followed me into my house. Within seconds, he had me down on the floor and made it clear what he intended to do. He said that he knew that that, that was what I wanted, that I had enticed him. My crime? Mowing the lawn on Southern California summer, southern, summer afternoons while wearing shorts. I tried to talk him out of it and tried to get away. Now, although I'm not very tall, I'm 5'4", I've always been very strong, but he was much stronger than I. Then I noticed a look of fear in his eyes. My dog, Huxley, had him by the throat. Now, Huxley was a big black dog, part Labrador Retriever and part Doberman Pinscher, and definitely a product of hybrid vigor. I could see Huxley's great white fangs pressing on this bastard's throat, growling and drooling. I looked up and said, Good dog! Then the bastard's look turned to one of terror. I'll never forget that wonderful look of terror on his face. And then calmly explained to him that he was going to get up off me, leave my house, and never so much as look at me again, or I would let Huxley finish what he started. I was able to get Huxley to let go of the bastard, and then he left, blaming me as he left. He moved within days. I didn't report it to the police. He had rented a room for two old ladies across the street who made it clear that they would take his side, and they blamed me for him moving out. Now, these two women presented themselves as if butter wouldn't melt in their mouths, but in reality they were vile, vicious creatures who lied about everyone in the neighborhood. But I knew that any police officer would likely believe them over me. I mean, hey, I was a 20-something hippie-ish girl, you know. But even with this experience, I still can't imagine what it would be like to really be raped. What would have happened if Huxley hadn't been there? Even more, I can't imagine what it would have been like to have become pregnant by such a monster. There's no way that I could ever tell someone, as some members of the religious right have, to make the best of it. There is no way that I could imagine having a child of rape. It is an abomination to even suggest such a thing. And yet the religious right wants to stop abortion, even in the case of rape and incest. All abortions aren't done because of rape, of course. But it's not for me, and especially not for them, the fundies, to judge someone else's decisions and why they make them. But what about abortion? The reasoning is that life begins at the moment of conception. This is actually a pretty new idea. For hundreds of years, at least, a fetus wasn't considered a person until the moment of quickening or movement. And let's take a look at that. Now, I don't have the exact figures, but from what I understand, at least one in four or one in six pregnancies end in a spontaneous termination. 
Now, I hope someone out there who's better versed in examining the scientific literature can let me know what the correct number is. Citation would be a good idea since you know that this data will be challenged. Let's take the difference for a moment and say it's 1 in 5 or 20 percent. Now, many of these are just flushed out of the body by the monthly menstrual cycle without the woman even being aware. Again, percentage and citations would be helpful. But it's been a long time since I've been in school, and all I'd be able to see are the abstracts, and, and you can't necessarily tell what's in the paper from the abstracts. So what this means is that a considerable number of people take a trip through the sewer systems to the wastewater treatment plant monthly. Some might even land in the local dump as they are disposed of on sanitary pads or tampons. Now this may be unpleasant to think about, but if someone really believes that life begins at conception, this is what happens. And I can't help but wonder just how many people this amounts to in this country per year who end up uh, being disposed of. Now if this is so, the only thing to do is to preserve the results of every woman's monthly cycle. Now this could be restricted to women who are only who are only who are sexually active, but how would we know if a woman lied or not? I suppose there could be special toilets or toilet inserts, you know, something like Tupperware, to contain the your um, potential humans. The next question would be what to do with these remains. Testing to see which ones contain fertilized cells and which didn't would be outrageously expensive and would take money away from health care, education, police, and fire protection for those people who are actually alive. So possibly there could be a central collection station in periodic uh, funerals. Or individuals would have to handle the burden themselves, whether on a monthly basis or some other interval. Hopefully freezing between times would be okay. Nasty thought, isn't it? Now the reasoning for this is that at the moment of conception, God inserts the soul. But what if God doesn't? Allowing people to be flushed away is certainly not an intelligent design. Perhaps, since God knows all, God doesn't put souls into those zygotes that won't implant. Therefore, no humans are being flushed. If that's so, then wouldn't it, be a great, it wouldn't be a great leap to consider that perhaps God doesn't put souls into those zygotes that will be aborted, since God would know which ones those were. Now, some might say that one is a natural process and the other isn't. But what difference would that make to God? And if you assume that you know what is in the mind of God, well, that's blasphemy. So stop it. What I'm trying to say here is that this isn't simple, nor is it obvious. And it's clear that since no one knows for certain when a person actually becomes a person or when one obtains a soul, if one obtains a soul, then the opinions and decisions of all need to be respected. If you don't believe in abortion, don't have one. However, for those still concerned about this, I have a modest proposal. Take the burden off women. When boys are about 16 or so, take them to a doctor and have reversible, well, valves, I guess, inserted and have them turned off. Now, I know this would be uncomfortable, but for men it would be a one-time thing, and then they could have all the sex they wanted without worrying about getting someone pregnant. There's still the problem of boys under 16, but I think that could be solved with a combination of severe curfews, ankle monitors, or perhaps even tracking chips. Now, this isn't a possibility yet that I know of, but with enough funding, I'm sure it could become a reality. Now, some might be against this because it is a form of birth control, but consider the alternatives. Some might object because they think this is imposing on a male's right to his own body, but these same people think nothing of interfering with a woman's right to her own body. Others might object, thinking that this is like sterilization, but since it's reversible, it isn't. The valves could be turned on at the appropriate time. It could even be part of the wedding planning. Get the flowers, get the cake, get the caterer, get the groom unfixed. I'd like to know the male point of view on this. So what do you think, fellas? One little operation when you're young? And no worries after. Thank you for listening.